Okay, let's name some ionic compounds. Let's start with some reasonably straightforward ones. This one here, sodium and fluorine. Well, we have to recognize first that this is an ionic compound because of the metal non-metal pattern we see. And so with ionic compounds, the metal retains its name as if it were not in the ionic compound. So we just call this one sodium. Fluorine, you see the fluorine atom here, because it's in an ionic compound, it becomes fluoride. So we change the ending. We add the suffix IDE. We replace INE with IDE. That's pretty consistent with all monatomic anions. Let's try another one. Common to all of us is sodium and this item here. It's not sodium chlorine, it's sodium chloride. about this one here. NG with an F. This would be, and we have to have a 2 here, because the 2 from our previous determination of charge video, there's two fluorides, or two fluorides I should say, because magnesium has a positive 2 charge. So in this case, it's magnesium fluoride. Now I want to point out something here. We did not use any prefixes here, such as mono, di, tri, tetra, etc., etc. There are no numbers in these names of the formulas. This is not magnesium 2 fluoride or magnesium fluoride 2 or magnesium difluoride. It's not that. Those mono, di, tri, tetra, etc., etc., are only used for covalent compounds. Let's try a couple more here. These are always fun ones right here. Iron and oxide. Well, recognize we have a transition metal. And as soon as you recognize we have a transition metal in your formula, think multiple charge states. And if you have multiple charge states, you need to include the charge number in the name of the formula. So I'm just going to write this as iron oxide. But I'm going to leave a space here. And what I'm going to do is put parentheses here for the charge on the iron. Well, the question is now what's the charge? Well, if you recall from previous video, or our determining charges on ions video, that oxide is always going to be negative 2. Therefore, the iron is always going to be, in this case, positive 2. So we put a Roman numeral 2 here because the charge on the iron is 2. So iron 2 oxide. Let's try this one here. Fe2O3. Well, I see it's an iron oxide. So I'm going to write that down. Iron Parentheses, oxide, now the question is what's that charge? Well, from our analysis 
on our other video, we, we learned that this contribution from oxide is negative 6, and therefore the contribution from each of the two irons must be positive 3 to make a total of positive 6. So this is iron 3 oxide. Again, I want to point out that up here we did not have any charge denotions, or notations in between the names of each of the ions. We didn't have to put magnesium 2 or sodium 1 because these cations you need to recognize are not transition metal cations, therefore do not have multiple charge state possibilities. Let's try some more. What about this one here? Copper and an oxide. Recognize that these are all ionic compounds because of the metal, non-metal pattern we see in the formula. Metal, non-metal. So copper, oxide. Now I'm going to leave a space here and put parentheses because Copper is a transition metal and has, has multiple charge states. So now the question is, what's the charge on the copper? Is it going to be 1 because there's one of them? Hmm. No, look back over here at iron oxide. The oxide was always negative 2. Therefore, it forced the iron to be positive 2. Same thing here. Oxide is always negative 2, so it's going to force this copper to be positive 2. So this is copper 2 oxide. Now let's look at this compound. So this is another copper oxide. But it's tempting to call this one here copper 2 oxide only because of the 2 after the copper. But that is not right. The 2, as far as this, this 2 in this formula, it means that there's two copper ions. It doesn't have anything to do with the charge. It just says there's two coppers. Well, if there's two coppers, and we have one oxide, take a look at this again this oxide is always going to be negative 2. There are two coppers with unknown charge right now. From the other video, we learned that the charge on each copper is going to be positive 1 because collectively all these charges have to sum up to 0. So this is going to be called copper 1 oxide. Let's try a few more down here. Lead sulfate. Well, I'm going to leave parentheses here because Lead is not necessarily a transition metal, but it's one of the metals in the main group down at the lower part of the periodic table that can have multiple charge states. So this is going to be sulfate. So we know that each the charge on sulfate collectively is negative 2 and there's one lead, so this must be lead 2 sulfate. On the other hand, if we have something like this,
lead. Take a guess at what this one's going to be. It's going to be lead chloride. What's the charge on each lead, or on the lead in, in this formula? It must be positive 4. So we put a Roman numeral 4 there. Because each chloride is negative 1. But there's 4 of them. So we multiply the, each one by 4. So it forces the lead to be positive 4. So we see two compounds with lead. One is lead 2, this one's lead 4. Let's see if I can squeeze in two more here. Gold. Gold is a transition metal, so we're going to leave parentheses blank for now. This has got to be lit, uh, excuse me, gold one because there's one chloride, and each chloride has a negative one. Let's try one more. Gold phosphate. Okay, there's one gold and there's one phosphate. So it's called gold not gold one phosphate. We have to figure out what the charge is going to be. Each phosphate as a poly as a polyatomic anion, each phosphate, if you remember, is negative three. And if there's one phosphate, that forces the gold to be positive three. So this is going to be called gold three phosphate. So let's take a look at what we have here. Pattern in all of them is that there's a metal, non-metal pattern in all of them to recognize that it's an ionic compound. And notice the cation in all of these compounds are monatomic metals. And notice we only included a charge state in the name when we had transition metals. And of course lead is one of the exceptions because it's off in the main group left, or excuse me, right main group metals down at the bottom. But for these group 1 and group 2 metals, such as sodium and magnesium, there's no need to put the charge state, because they can only exist in one charge state. That's one thing. The other thing is that we don't see any di, tris, tetras in any of these names. As much as it might be tempting to put maybe diiron trioxide here, for example, or maybe I've seen this one too, silver phosphorus tetraoxide, that's not appropriate. You need to recognize polyatomic ions and formulas. And don't call this one here lead tetrachloride, simply lead for chloride.